Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, so let's get let's get weird a little bit here. This is uh, I decided to go a little bit off the uh, the beaten path here for this talk, but you know I think you've heard from a lot of my collaborators about um, a lot of that kind of experimental work uh, that we've all been uh, you know uh, working together toward uh, you know pushing these things to bigger and bigger molecules. And I'll give a special shout out for this talk to whoever like referee B was for that. Uh, paper with the uh, Claire's paper where we were talking about functionalizing things because they asked a great question which is what happens if you try to optically cycle something and you can't resolve the P branch so whoever you are referee B thank you very much it was a, it was a wonderful question okay so here's where we went so I'm going to talk about the Doppler effect we've been talking about uh, laser cooling a lot over the past two days and the translational Doppler effect is quite familiar if we have counter propagating beams here and our molecule is moving you know what happens. In the molecules frame, it sees two different laser frequencies instead of one, uh, and they kind of move apart from one another. Um, I'm going to argue that there's a similar thing that happens with rotation that you may not be quite as familiar with. If I imagine that I have a linearly polarized laser beam illuminating a molecule, and the molecule is rotating, and if you think about yourself as being that dipole moment, and you are fixed to the molecule's frame of reference, then as you're rotating, what you're going to see is that you see two frequencies, right? And the reason you're going to see two frequencies is because these photons have this helicity. And you know, you'll, you'll see the right-handed photons kind of circulating around at a slightly different speed than the left-handed photons, right? Um, and this is, in some ways, you know, kind of a Stern-Gerlach uh, measurement, uh, but for light, right? You, you, I'm talking about kind of a classical molecule here. We have a classical measurement device maybe the average helicity of the beam is zero because it's linearly polarized, but you don't get zero when you measure it, you get you know, either minus one or plus one when you measure it. The Stern-Gerlach effect, for those of you that don't know, is a famous experiment that happened in Nevada sometime in the 1980s. <laughs> okay, so uh, I like to think of the Doppler effect as an atomic physicist, and there's a great derivation of how to get at this thing uh, by none other than Fermi. So let's uh, go through this because it's really instructive. Uh, we know that we have conservation of energy and momentum uh, that we can use in a situation like this. So if we have some atom or molecule, it's got a mass, it's got a velocity, we have a photon that has some momentum, conservation of momentum gets us uh, the recoil, and we plug that in with conservation of energy, and what we get is exactly the Doppler shift that we expect. Okay, we get our, uh, get our k dot v here, all right? And then the, we have a little recoil term here as well, because uh, this is a gas phase atom, but it's, uh, it is what you expect uh, from your kind of non-relativistic Doppler effect. Now that's, that's one ingredient in our Doppler cooling. The other one is, you know, comes back to uh, an experiment uh, that happened in 1933, the Otto Frisch uh, experiment where he showed that you can deflect a beam of atoms using light. This kind of demonstrated the mechanical effect of light. It's the scattering force as we know it now, right? You just push these things. So you get these kids together and you get Doppler cooling, which is just one of the most clever ideas, I think, uh, in atomic physics. And it, it's one of these ideas that keeps giving. It keeps working better than people think again and again, uh, which is just amazing to me. Uh, that's, that's the sign of like a truly good idea. Uh, and, and it's just remarkable, right? So this is, this is pretty classic stuff. I mean, you can get old papers on it that uh, folks may you know, kind of know and love on these topics. If we you know, apply these beams from maybe three different, uh, along plus or minus of, of three different Cartesian axes, we can make a three-dimensional optical molasses. And this is, you know, I think the type of thing that we now teach uh, even to uh, undergrads in atomic physics classes. It's, it's really kind of the starting point for so many of the experiments that we do. And now, we're, we're doing this with molecules, which I think is, is quite amazing. Um, the great thing about this, uh, aside from you know, uh, things that uh, are, are probably obvious, is that the energy scale itself is considerably lower than the actual Doppler shift of atoms at that energy scale, or molecules at that energy scale. Right? This is one of the things that I think surprises people when they're first learning about Doppler cooling. You might say, well, it's going to cool things down to about the point where the Doppler shift itself is comparable uh, you know, to the line width or something like this. And no, it's, it's way cooler, okay? Uh, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable. And what we get is sub millikelvin temperatures typically uh, from this sort of thing. So I told you that there's this Doppler effect for rotation. Uh, how's that thing going to work? Let's apply our Fermi uh, method here to a big uh, molecule. You may recognize that one there, okay? 
Um, so we have this helicity of the photon. So the lambda is going to be plus or minus one, depending upon the handedness of the photon. And conservation of momentum gives us our recoil. Conservation of energy gives us a Doppler shift. And it looks just the same. I mean, these are like, you can basically make a little dictionary just mapping these things one onto the other. The mapping that pops out of this is that instead of kV, whoop, sorry, my laptop is sliding here on this surface. Instead of kV, we get a Doppler shift of omega. It is just the rotational frequency itself, which is a little different because that, you know, that, that's not a property of the light anymore, right? You know, here we had k and v for the translational case, but now this is just a property of the state of the molecule. So what's going on here? Well, if I think about this scenario uh, where I have a rotating molecule and it sees these two different colors of light, I can identify these two different colors as this kind of classical version of a P and an R branch in a molecule. When you think about it, this is, remember, this is in the molecule frame. The P branch here, if I want this to be resonant, the molecule is going to see it as bluer than it is. So if I want to resonantly drive that transition, I need to do something that is lower in frequency. I've got to lower my laser frequency in order to hit that. For the R branch, the, the story is just the opposite. So it's kind of, you know, kind of the classical version here. We, we don't have a quantized rotor, but we still get a P and an R branch when we do uh, conservation of momentum, angular momentum, and conservation of energy on this. Um, to take that sort of a little bit further, we can you know, use our quantum mechanics to do this in a little bit more detail. We have you know, some wave vector for our, uh, our light going in some direction. And if the angular momentum points along another direction, I'll just take the simple case where the dipole moment's along that angular momentum. Um, you know how to calculate what this is. Uh, but I don't know about you, you know, I, I love my J symbols, but I, I don't get a lot of intuition of what's going on there. This is really secretly just, you know, regular trigonometry. You essentially have, you know, sine of theta or sine of theta with a phase, right, and you square it, okay? You're just looking at the angle, you know, between these two to figure out which of these transitions you can drive and how easily. And when you take this, I think this is like a, I don't even know what, uh, J equals 20 case or something like that. What I've plotted here are the results of the quantum calculation of the data points. I mean, you all know how to do that thing. And then just the classical expressions with, with you know, sine of theta and cosine of theta, uh, they line up really, really well. And this, this kind of matches the story that I was talking about. If you have, for instance, J and K are parallel to one another, and you have a kind of sigma plus photon, it ought to be really hard for you to decrease the angular momentum of the thing. And sure enough, you know, sigma plus photon can't do it. You know, you're, you're not going to be able to drive those sorts of things. So, you know, you have to be careful because there's a little minus sign up here because theta and m uh, kind of have an odd relationship in this, but that's the general idea. Okay, so rotational, you can rotate, you can have a Doppler shift. It's, a, you know, only slightly different from translation, but it kind of works the same way. And this can be used, I think, to address some of the problems that we've heard about, especially today when we talk about big molecules. Uh, and one of the things that can come up in these big molecules is what referee B said. Okay, what happens if you can't resolve the P branch? You know, this was in uh, the, you know, Ben Stuhl and Jun Yi's paper, uh, you know, pointing out that you can close rotation by driving that P branch. Well, if, for instance, the natural line width is too big to do it, you can't do it anymore, right? You're going to be driving some Q branch and some R branch and some, you know, whatever it is, right? Polyatomic molecules, there's all sorts of stuff going on there. Another thing that can happen is that maybe rotation isn't closed because maybe it's just not closed. Uh, you know, I think there are a lot of us who are thinking about, you know, Ben talked about your know, reasons to imagine, uh, you know, that polyatomic molecules uh, that really conform to some of these cases, you know, can really be closed. But on the other hand, we've got, you know, some mysteries in the lab and, you know, maybe there are other reasons why things aren't closed. What are you going to do? Uh, well, you know, we can take our inspiration here, not from the Otto Frisch experiment in 1933, uh, but from Beth's experiment three years later. And I don't know how many people here know about Beth's experiment. I'm sure Bratislav knows about it. He knows all this stuff, right? Uh, but, uh, but Beth's experiment showed uh, not the translational uh, uh, mechanical effect of light, but rather the rotational. He uh, shined a light that was circularly polarized, or I'm uh, sorry, I think it was linearly polarized through a wave plate that made it circularly polarized and it actually recoiled uh, in an angular fashion. It was really remarkable. And so now instead of using these linear uh, 
photon uh, momenta here. We can use these angular photon momenta uh, that all have the same value. It's just h bar. Uh, and maybe do some laser cooling of the rotation. And that, hopefully, would get us from this regime where we've populated a googly jillion states because we're working with big molecules, which is, by the way, awesome. I mean, I don't know, five years ago, I don't think any of us thought we were going to be doing this. But th this is really like, quite, quite cool. It's been awesome to be a part of it. Um, you know, we want to actually increase our population in those ground states. And remember, we can do it much better than this width. That's the crazy thing about this, right? You know, you can actually, you can actually make the uh, distribution itself, the, the Doppler shifts, if you're willing to buy my story about how these PNR branches are really from Doppler shifts, you can make those be smaller uh, than the width. Okay. So we can make a little correspondence table and go through the derivation, figure out how we can do the Doppler cooling, and it just maps one to one. We can start with a force. Okay, now we have a damping torque instead of a damping force. Uh, you say uh, linear momentum diffusion coefficient. I say angular momentum diffusion coefficient. Um, you know, the plots are exactly the same because everything just maps right onto one another. Uh, we get the same expressions and we get the same limiting temperature in this case. Um, and I want to point out uh, here that uh, these ideas uh, were developed in this paper down here, but really uh, I want to highlight Ben Algenbron, uh, who did a wonderful job uh, on simulations of how this works. Uh, you, we, I'm happy to talk to people about it, but I chose to shorten the duration of my talk, uh, so I'm not going to actually go into it, uh, but I'm happy to do that. Okay, um, so I, before uh, maybe going on to getting a little bit wilder here, I will point out that some of these things were noticed actually previously in the community of people who think about cooling nanoparticles. Uh, they have, you know, there are papers that are essentially talking about Doppler cooling of rotation of, of nanoparticles. And, uh, you know, a lot of the ideas are the same. They didn't, you know, uh, necessarily speak the same sort of language or, or think about the quantum regime the same way or the way the transitions work the same way. But I, I do want to point out that, you know, we're following the footsteps of some of, uh, some of the people who noticed some of the same effects here. Okay, so I mentioned that we could derive the Doppler limit, and there are multiple ways of doing that. You can think about just, you know, making energy changes equal to one another or working through kind of diffusion coefficients and, and things like that. Uh, but fundamentally what's going on here is you have a fluctuation, which is the momentum diffusion, and you have dissipation, uh, which is the momentum damping. And when you have fluctuation and dissipation, you usually say, someone should make a theorem about that, right? And yet there was somebody, and his name was Albert Einstein, okay? And, and, you know, we have an Einstein relation that shows up when you have fluctuations and dissipations. So this system comes into a steady state or quasi-steady state. I don't know what you want to call it, detailed balance or something like that, right? We reach some kind of a Doppler temperature, a limiting temperature, where the temperature itself is not fluctuating uh, that much anymore, right? Um, what are we coming into equilibrium with or into steady state? You know, how, how does this work? Well, you know, if you think about the rotational case, I think it becomes a little bit more clear how to interpret this than the translational case. Here we have, for instance, a fluctuation based on whether this thing absorbs a lambda's plus one photon versus a lambda's minus one photon. And when it's, you know, at a very slow rotational speed, that Doppler shift is almost completely absent, so it's just as likely to, to absorb one or the other. You know, this is what we call quantum projection noise. Okay, that is what the thing is somehow you know, coming to terms with as it's getting down to the Doppler temperature. And it's, I think it's just a little bit clearer in the rotational case than the translational case. It's, I think, also clear in the translational case. The way you make a MOT is typically taking a beam and putting it on some beam splitters. So each photon actually comes at the thing from multiple directions. And what you're doing is measuring that photon in some basis other than, the, you know, the one that uh, represents its actual state at that time. It's sort of in the x basis eigenstate, and you're measuring the z basis in some sense. Okay. All right. So uh, if that's really what we're coming to equilibrium with, or yeah, that's too strong of a statement, if that's somehow what we're, uh, you know, uh, balancing out with our cooling, then what, you know, what is doing the cooling and what is doing the heating? Well, um, one of the things that we can think about here is trying to separate out the steps that we do in laser cooling. So here is an atom, but we're at a molecule conference, so you just switch into Greek mode on your keyboard, and now it's a molecule, okay? And what we can do is we can think about laser cooling in some system like this, and I can do this, first of all, with a narrow line width excitation, a laser, okay? And this laser 
can drive a transition in a velocity selective way um, is that laser cooling it is laser but it is not cooling that's a completely unitary operation that laser does zero cooling in this case all right we can then keep going here and we have a next step where we're going to actually couple to a state that spontaneously emits all right that step is cooling but it is not laser okay that can be broadband light that could be a flashlight okay and to kind of drive this point home you know thinking about this you know we're at UCLA and you know we actually have a, a wonderful source of broadband light available to us almost every single day all day all right and that is the Sun so we, we are, are uh, working, I have an outstanding undergraduate, Amanda, uh, is working on uh, building this scheme with a trapped ion. We're going to laser cool a trapped ion using sunlight. Because if you want a thermal source of light and you want to be as bright as possible, you want to be continuous, I actually don't know of a better one than the sun. So Amanda has built a sun tracker. It's totally awesome. It's this thing, you know, it's got like robot arms and it sits on the roof. She's coupled it into a single mode fiber. It's got tons of great physics. This is a great project for an undergrad. Just thinking about how much light you can get into a fiber is really fun. The answer is 32 microwatts, by the way. That is it. That is it. The, you cannot get any more. It doesn't matter how big your lens is because uh, of you know, basically thermal uh, statistics, right? Um, and uh, so she's working on, on that project. And we're going to just try to demonstrate this as a little sort of you can really separate these two aspects of laser cooling. Um, so I, I talked about, um, you know, some, you know, I didn't talk that much about the work that these folks did. I talked mostly about crazy things because I wanted to be provocative here. Uh, but, you know, these folks are, are, you know, deserve a lot of credit for just getting us to the point where talking about crazy things like this is, is actually something that, you know, maybe we need to start doing. Um, and so with that, I'm happy to take questions and thanks for your attention. So if you have a big enough molecule, like a coronavirus, it's pretty continuous. Um, <laughs> if, you have, if you have a tight trap, then your translation is not continuous, right? You would call it sideband cooling in that case. It becomes quantized. So I think this is kind of two sides of the same coin. You can move you know, from one regime into the other regime. And there are some aspects of it that change slightly when you do that. But fundamentally, it is still... Um, you're, you're driving the excitation contingent upon the sort of amount of energy that the system begins with. And that's sort of that key first part. You know, that's the unitary step. And then after that, you, you have the cooling step. So I view them as being very much the same thing. So in, in practice, for example, for GOPH, how mm -hmm. would it work? So there you would, uh, you would just, you would need to broaden your laser because in calcium phenoxide, uh, those lines actually are resolved. But if you had like a picosecond uh, pulse laser or something, you park it on the red side uh, and you would, you know, you would need to just see how it goes. Now there, you know, if P branches and R branches start crossing, you know, things get really complicated. You know, ben is really the expert. He, he did the, the uh, simulations that are in our paper there. But what we found is that you typically get cooling. It's really hard to break it because it's laser cooling. Laser cooling is genius, right? Um, and sometimes what you get is that the energies all gather around a finite value of J instead of around J equals zero, but it's still cooling. That's still low entropy. It's just, you know, trend, you know it's up at some higher uh, value. Or you'll get two peaks that show up in different places because there's multiple fixed points in the differential equation that describes the thing. But, you know, generally it, it all still seems to work. That's what I'll say. Thanks.